Hello, everybody, and welcome to Out of the Short Box. This is Josiah, and today we're going to have a creator cast on Alan Moore. So join us as we learn about this interesting character who's gave us some of the most popular titles you probably don't know about. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Out of the Short Box. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Alan Moore. Uh, it's a, cre- a special creator cast talking about uh, one of the most famous comic book authors that ever lived. Uh, Alan Moore has created a ton of titles that most people are not knowledgeable of, of creating. Uh, most of the time when I talk to people who don't have a, a lot of uh, background knowledge into comic books, I'll mention some of these titles and they're stunned because a lot of Alan's titles um, are famous uh, because they've been adapted into uh, movies and uh, or they've been referenced in uh, other comic book lines. And uh, Alan's talent is uh, one of a kind, and the man is definitely one of a kind. And I'll talk about that in his, uh, his uh, in- intricity, I guess you could say, his uniqueness uh, for Alan Moore. Uh, but he is definitely one of my favorite, if not my favorite, comic book authors. Um, Alan Moore, just to give you a little bit of background, he created such titles as V for Vendetta, uh, he created From Hell, uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Watchmen, The Killing Joke, What Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. He wrote Swamp Thing. He created the character of John Constantine. He wrote Miracle Men, Promethea, and Jerusalem, which are some of his most current titles that he's done. Uh, and I'm sure when I mention some of them, like V for Vendetta and The Watchmen, in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen from Hell. Many of you probably have seen those movie adaptations. And, of course, if you're a Batman fan, you know the influence of The Killing Joke and how much it is. So this is just not uh, some random author. This man has, uh, is very famous for helping comic books become uh, what it was today. Uh, Alan Moore was born in 1953 in Northampton, England, where he still resides today. Uh, a small middle town, uh, England, uh, famous throughout history, has some famous locations, and uh, he still resides there today. Um, he was an avid comic book reader in his teenage years. He, he enjoyed reading comics as, as uh, a lot did during that, that time era. Uh, the time era where Alan grew up was definitely in the, in the Cold War era. Uh, he was... Uh, that was always there, and a lot of people don't have this knowledge, but during the height of the Cold War, especially during those times in the 60s and 70s, the United States actually had uh, submarines, uh, bases, located off the coast of England that were armed with nuclear with nuclear bombs, uh, aimed at Russia in case they had to uh, interact for any reason. Uh, they were located in the U.S. military bases, uh, which were just there off the coast of England. Another comic book writer, uh, Grant Morrison, uh, refers to his memory of those as well, uh, and just the fear that they had. And comic books was kind of an escape for a lot of these. Uh, Alan just enjoyed comic books, though. He enjoyed the art. He enjoyed the, the language of them. And uh, he, he grew up with it. Uh, when he was a child growing up, he was considered a child genius. He scored high on many levels and was an excellent uh, student. Uh, in fact, uh, it was requested that he go to one of the higher chartered schools of England, but his family was too poor uh, to send him from there. So Alan wasn't very challenged at school, and he always gave uh, the, the comment that even if he did go to one of those higher-end schools, he probably wouldn't have been uh, challenged there either just because of the attitude and the reputation of the school systems. So during his teenage years um, in high school, I guess you could say he, he rebelled, and he was actually expelled from high school for selling uh, LSD. Um, so he was expelled from there, and since he was expelled from there, he, he immediately got a job. He got a job as a janitor, which he always, uh, instead of using the term janitor, he always said that he got a job cleaning toilets. Um, he did get married uh, during that time, uh, which that marriage uh, did not last. <coughs> uh, he tried uh, to make money, so one of the things that he did was he went to the source that he loved, and he went to comic books. Uh, In the uh, late 70s, like 1979, and in the early 80s, he started writing individual comic pages 
uh, for small British publications, for small magazines. He would do, you know, just a couple pages, um, and he would write for them, submitting comment for those. <clears throat> it was those in 1979 that he created uh, one of his most long-going uh, characters and, and famous characters in Britain. Uh, he created Maxwell the Magic Cat. Um, and that started gaining him a little bit of notoriety in the British comic book world. It got his foot in the door, and so he started beginning to have uh, more uh, writing shots uh, with Doctor Who and 2000 AD comics in England. So he submitted stories for those and wrote for those. In 1982, however, was when he first got his big contract, his sustaining contract, where it wasn't just spot work, but he actually got uh, consistent work. And there was a comic magazine that was created called Warrior. Um, and it start, they started giving Alan consistent work um, and his chance to share uh, some of his stories and some of his most longer and continued stories. Out of those, <clears throat> we got some of the most famous titles he wrote, such as Marvel Man and, of course, V for Vendetta. Which and those took audiences by storm. They had never been done before. They were black and white magazines. They were simple black and white comics, uh, but the literature and the art style was was was, was magnificent. Um, Alan wrote a great script for these comic books, and, and he 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 let out his thoughts. Alan was one of the first comic book writers, uh, in my opinion. When you look, when you read some of those golden age, you see hints and and you see hints and, and little subtle things. Uh, but Alan was very direct, was was very confrontational in his writing, and that's what people wanted. Uh, no longer uh, did people just relate to these characters, but these characters were living in the same world that was experiencing uh, such a thing. V for Vendetta uh, was written, and, and Alan testifies to this, and you can see it, um, for Alan's fear of uh, the Margaret Thatcher, uh, the alt-right uh, movement that was going on in England, at the time, uh, which if you compare alt-right movements now, uh, they were few and far between. Uh, but Alan had a, a fear of, of Margaret Thatcher and, and some of the laws that were coming up. Um, there was a law that was going to, uh, and it did pass in England and was carried out for a while until it was uh, further abolished. Uh, but that actually um, uh, made uh, homosexuality illegal. Uh, it was passed by uh, Margaret Thatcher. So during this time, uh, 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 during this time in, 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 in British history, Britain had gone back and forth, back and forth over um, homosexual rights. Uh, in 1967, uh, there was a law passed uh, that gave some of those rights back uh, to 21-year-olds, and that was in proper England and Scotland. That was never adapted. Um, homosexuality was actually illegal up to that point. But the, the big driving factor between all of this time was, uh, especially during the 1980s, was the AIDS scare. Uh, Britain had rising uh, cases of AIDS, and, and, and the scare was taken seriously. So... Um, uh, Margaret Thatcher started talking about this uh, in the early 80s, and then in uh, 1987 she actually introduced it and it passed, and it was called Clause 28, which ended up becoming uh, Section 28, which that eventually overturned. But Alan's fear of it was uh, that it would become fascist. Um, it wasn't just Clause 28 that bothered him. What what bothered him was he felt that the uh, government was overstepping its bounds, and he feared a fascist society. Uh, Alan Moore is very much an anarchist. He believes in, in anarchy um, in, in that much. And uh, while, while, in my opinion, that view is flawed as well, um, he's always uh, had fear uh, of fascism, uh, uh, of a fascist government coming to be. And uh, V for Vendetta is a great book which shows how easily accepted uh, fascism can be in a society. Uh, it, it, when you read it, you, you see hints of how uh, Germany was able to embrace Nazism and so on and so forth. So V for Vendetta is still strong today. Of course, it was made into a movie, which many of you all know. And again, it outstreets uh, shown how uh, certain 
uh, governments can overstretch their bounds. So this was very in your face, and uh, he wrote that, and it became very famous. So he began uh, gaining some notoriety, uh, especially in, in Britain. So in 1983, uh, Alan Moore was uh, one of the artists that was recruited by DC's uh, publisher and president at the time, uh, Jeanette Kahn, which I'll eventually do a podcast about her. Jeanette was brilliant. Uh, She created the British Invasion into DC Comics, basically. And uh, it was based on two... It was based on twofold. It was... uh, Jeanette was honest with these British uh, writers who she brought over. uh, Such writers as as Grant Morrison and and, uh, Alan Moore. uh, Dave Gibbons uh, came over and then eventually influenced Neil Gaiman as well uh, to come over as well, um, even though Neil was later on in the movement. Um, but Jeanette Kahn approached Alan to write for Swamp Thing, which had very low sales, and uh, DC was considering actually abandoning uh, the title. Uh, so she approached uh, Alan, and Alan gracefully took it, and he wrote the, the Swamp Thing saga in 84 and 85, and it sold like gangbusters. And it became so popular that it, it revitalized Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing became popular again, uh, so so much so that eventually in 1990 it became a television series again, and the character has uh, maintained itself as a DC character. Um, but Alan actually added to... Um, the saga something he added to the continuity uh he added the parliament of trees and he 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 made swamp thing more of an elemental uh type uh character uh who was there for the green and gave a lot of the aspects that we know of swamp thing uh today uh it was very in your face again as alan always did um, and it was just an excellent excellent piece of, of literature uh, in 1986, however, um, Alan wrote his biggest claim to fame, probably the work uh, that everyone knows, especially if you're a comic book fan, because uh, I, not just me, I say me, but I, I'm not, you know, it, it, it's, it's a lot of us fans of comic books attribute this. Uh, there was two main comic books that came out in the mid-80s which changed the genre into what we have it today. It, it took it from... Uh, it, yeah. Now it was evolving over time from being just a childish, uh, you know, child, uh, uh, a child peach, piece of literature. In the golden age, you had it being very much adult, with having it uh, ha- have it a little bit for kids. Uh, but there, uh, when the Comic Book Authority came out, because uh, of the fears in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, you still had where they kind of. Uh, took down the writing a little bit, uh, made it a little bit more fantastical, uh, and, and it was uh, it, it was available for children during this time. But in the 80s, uh, we had some of these writers who enjoyed these comics, and they made them very much adult, very much in your face, very much uh, hitting on on social issues, on on social norms. And uh, the two writers that did that was Alan Moore and Frank Miller. Uh, Alan Moore in 1986, along with his partner Dave Gibbons, uh, created The Watchmen. Uh, the Watchmen used characters which DC had attained in 1983 when they purchased Charlton Comics. Uh, they had uh, uh, they uh, purchased from Charlton Comics uh, characters such as The Question, uh, Captain Adam, uh, Owlman, uh, and... Uh, uh, they also uh, had obtained um, Blue Beetle, uh, which they ended up using as a mainline character. Uh, but uh, they had to, DC had to figure out how to use uh, these characters. Due to copyright laws, they didn't want to lose the rights to these characters. So they had to figure out a way uh, to use the question and to use Captain Adam and to use some of these that they didn't do. So they approached Alan Moore. Uh, Alan had an idea of a comic book that he wanted to write. And DC said um, that they could use the characters, they could change the names, but still kind of keep the base um, idea uh, of the characters, and they did. And they created the Watchmen. You had Rorschach, who was modeled off the question. You had uh, Dr. Manhattan, which was uh, based off of Captain Adam. Uh, you know, and, uh, you had uh, Night Owl, which, is, which was with Owlman. Man. 
And uh, so you just had those those characters, uh, which were adapted to the Watchmen. The Watchmen was very much in your face. It took place in uh, Cold War era America, where uh, and also a time when Richard Nixon had uh, maintained. Uh, the presidency, uh, where there was uh, no law passed on presidential terms, and he was actually elected to a third term, and he was the the president during uh, this time during the 80s uh, when we were at war with Russia, and it showed a lot of those Cold War tensions, and it showed the humanity and and comic book heroes. You had uh, the comedian who dealt with uh, just his raw, visceral self, his hatred. Uh, but also showed a little bit of his love, uh, but he just didn't know how to place it. Um, it showed uh, the anger and the angst of um, uh, of people living in the Cold War era, not knowing if the next day was going to be their last and if they were going to be dumped into a uh, nuclear holocaust. Uh, it was brilliantly written. Um, you have you see Dr. Manhattan, you see a lot of Alan's beliefs in Dr. Manhattan, uh, where he broke down bits and pieces to the smallest be- uh, bits. He, uh, Dr. Manhattan talks about his father being a, a watchmaker and tearing down the watches to their to their final to, 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 to the smallest piece to understand how it really works and Dr. Manhattan talks about how he's done that with men, how he's dissected men uh, to their very last uh, piece just to see what makes us tick and we see that with the Watchmen and it's a very very great book and I highly recommend doing it uh, but that was in 1986 and that was really his biggest hit and when that happened Alan became very 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 famous um, he was constantly uh, in the media he was being uh, chased after uh, by publishers other publishers are trying to get him to write for them, uh, DC was uh, wanted to extend contract and was wanting to gain rights to more of his characters. Um, it became a hustle and bustle game, and Alan didn't like that. He he didn't like that at all. He thought it took away from his art. Uh, so he basically stood up and he said, "I can't do this anymore," and he left. Um, he cut ties with DC. But at the same time, DC maintained rights to the Watchmen. They maintained rights to V for Vendetta um, and also the, the facets of the Swamp Thing uh, that he wrote for them. But Alan didn't care. Uh, he just really wanted to, to continue on and, and do his own thing. He wasn't in it for the money, as he said. He was in it for the art. Um, during that time, he continued to write uh, his Maxwell the Magic Cat serial for the newspaper in Northampton, England. However, uh, during this time, uh, between 1988 and 1990, the newspaper had published some anti, uh, anti-LGBT anti uh, type uh, issues. And because of that, uh, Alan removed, uh, he stopped writing Maxwell the Magic Cat in protest. Um, and during that time, during that tumultuous time of 88 through 90, Allen tried to create his own publishing arm, but he failed. Um, he had also entered a polygamous, polygamous marriage, but uh, with, with his declining uh, assets, they eventually left him. Um, in 1993, Alan resurfaced. It was his 40th birthday, and on his 40th birthday, he announced to his fans and to the world that he was a practicing magician. Uh, that he had held uh, closely to um, uh, Alistair Crowley's uh, view of magic and that it can be done uh, through uh, more of incantation, but also he accepted beliefs of the Kabbalah, uh, which was uh, the magic arm of uh, Judaism, which was an offset. It wasn't Judaism, but it had its roots in Judaism. And he accepted uh, Kabbalah, and he, uh, he, he declares himself... Uh, a practicing uh, magician. He believes that magic is done through words, through language, and through art. He believes in uh, that there's two separate areas, the material and the immaterial. And the immaterial is where we can basically almost speak things into existence to where uh, we can influence ourselves with words, uh, that we can influence ourselves through art and make reality what it is through what we say and what we do. Uh, he still believes that today and considers himself 
uh, a practicing magician. There's some people that'll call him a wizard just because of the way he looks. However, uh, it's from my understanding, through my research, he's never referred to himself as a wizard, just as a practicing uh, ma- magician. Uh, to this day, he still refuses for his name to appear on any of um, the films that his work inspired. Uh, you will not see his uh, him have any credit for uh, V for Vendetta or for uh, The Watchmen or League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, uh, who, which he also wrote, or From Hell. You will not. Uh, they may mention his name, uh, but he doesn't want it on there. I know Watchmen; it doesn't. It just says Dave Gibbon's name on it. I do not believe that League of Extraordinary Gentlemen has it on there as well, and uh, V for Vendetta. If they do refer to it, it's been edited in, and it's not what Alan wants. Alan does not receive any money from the royalties for those. Um, In fact, when the Occupy movements became popular and the um, anonymous uh, movements became uh, popular, they adopted the... uh, the mask from uh, the Guy Fox mask from V for Vendetta, and uh, they, they use it as symbolism for that today. And what, what, what little people don't know is that for every V for Vendetta mask, every Guy Fox mask that is sold, uh, DC Comics actually gets a portion of those proceeds, uh, and none of it, it goes to Alan at all. Um, during that time, though, he has written uh, some other books from hell. Uh, is one of his greatest books. He began writing it in the 80s, uh, began creating it, but it took him years to, to finally get done, which From Hell is the uh, is uh, about the Jack the Ripper killings in 19... Uh, I mean, in 1888. Uh, it's uh, Alan's take uh, uh, on the uh, Jack the Ripper uh, case. Um, it's a lot of factual, a lot of history. I highly recommend it, uh, especially if you're interested in the Jack the Ripper killings, and it's a unique. Uh, however, it has been considered as one of the possibilities uh, for the Jack the Ripper uh, killings. It, it's, it, uh, it focuses on, in on one suspect, one suspect that Alan believes was the killer in it. Um, some people consider it sensational, but it's very interesting from a historical aspect. So I highly recommend you reading From Hell. Uh, it was made into a movie starring Johnny Depp. Uh, the movie was very, very well done. Um, however, there's bits and pieces uh, of the comic uh, that are much more. It's very thick, very long, uh, but I highly recommend you uh, reading that book as well. He created a book called Promethea, which is, again, one of his newer titles. And Promethea consisted of 32 comics, which was intentional because of the number 32. And he mapped out the Kabbalah with each and every one of these issues, each level of uh, stage and of, of realization uh, from the Kabbalah uh, was strong in Promethea. Uh, he, he eventually created and published a book, too, which is, uh, to me... Um, frightening. I don't like the book. Um, I steer clear away from it, but it's probably because of my own personal belief system. Uh, Alan does admit that it's pornographic. He calls it blatantly pornographic, uh, but he uh, he wrote it, and then his uh, now wife, Melinda Gebby, uh, she was the illustrator on it, and it's called Lost Girls, um, and it's about some of the famous uh, characters that we know of uh, from fairy tales, uh, three characters mainly. It was uh, uh, Alice from Alice in Wonderland and Alice in the Looking Glass. Um, and it had the Dorothy Gale uh, from The Wizard of Oz and uh, Wendy from uh, Peter Pan. And uh, in the book, uh, it, it goes, uh, uh, it gives a new spin on the tales. Um, as they recall their sexual exploits. Um, it, it's graphic. It's very graphic. Uh, it's go, it's got, came under scrutiny uh, because, again, we're dealing with uh, young girl characters uh, as well. Um, uh, but the, the book is horrific uh, to me, but it, it does approach subjects that need to be approached. It, it, it approaches... Uh, sexual abuse it, it approaches uh, those things so it's very in your face so if you don't like those types um, I wouldn't go for 
for lost girls at all it's really uh, much in your face but I definitely read some of Alan's stuff of course the killing joke gave us the quintessential Joker origin story while DC has said that the Joker doesn't have an origin and that's how they want to keep it um, most Batman fans consider if they're if we have to accept a Joker origin story we're going to accept Alan Moore's version of the Joker um, but it was really the first time where uh, the relationship between the Joker and uh, Batman and, and the, the need for both of them to have each other in their lives uh, was concrete. Um, so definitely, The Killing Joke is just excellent piece. DC made it into an animated movie. Um, however, uh, again, I uh, highly promote reading the book before the movie. Um, again, they add pieces to the animated universe. They take pieces out and so on and so forth like they do with most uh, adaptations. Uh, but I would definitely go uh, purchase The Killing Joke and read The Killing Joke uh, for what it is. Uh, the Swamp Thing saga was amazing. Um, again, that's where John Constantine was introduced into comic books as well. So if you're a huge Constantine fan, it's cool to see him in there. Um, and I highly recommend that as well. Uh, and uh, he also wrote a book called Jerusalem, which is kind of weird. So if you're into that kind of stuff, uh, do that. Um, but uh, the Swamp Thing Saga, Watchmen, of course, and um, the V for Vendetta are my top titles from him, and I highly recommend doing that. Uh, Alan's still live today. Um, and again, he lives in England, and he writes more for independent comic books from time to time. Uh, he does go on the circuit and speak a little bit. Um, however, he's kind of separated himself from the mainline comic books um, just because of how they're writing uh, right now and how they've gone. But he's been very instrumental in comic books, and he will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, comic book uh, writer of our time. So that's it for this Creator Cast. Uh, I'll catch you in the next podcast where we'll be talking probably about Jeanette Kahn. I want to do a little bit about Jeanette because she was an influential woman in D.C. and kind of helped shape what D.C. is today. So until then, uh, crack open one of the books I told you about, read some Alan Moore, and I'll catch you in the next podcast. Hey, and if you're still listening, why don't you follow us on Facebook and why don't you support us through Patreon.com. That's Patreon.com backslash out of the short box. We'll take a dollar. A dollar will help us go a long way in being able to uh, get our uh, program off the ground and do some YouTube uh, contrast. So until then, see you again. Support us again. Thanks.